want to talk eschatology. I, I'm, I'm very excited about people being open. I think more people need to be open-minded. Everybody needs to not be so sensitive and defensive. And uh, stop being a little girl. You know, be willing to just kind of discuss these things openly. All right, this is Tyler Baker, pastor here in Jacksonville, Florida, and you are watching the Contend for the Faith podcast. But there's not an episode number. So this is typically I've reserved the episode numbers for guests and uh, interviews and discussions and things of that nature. This is an impromptu video. Um, where I am going to be kind of given an introduction for a series that's coming up. I want to start talking more eschatology. And there's two reasons for this video. The first reason is a, an announcement, and that's that I'm going to be engaging or participating in a discussion uh, with Brother Tommy McMurtry and Brother Scott Clem in a couple of weeks. And this will be taking place on Pastor McMurtry's YouTube channel, The Spirit of Prophecy. The plan is that we all kind of bring our eschatological view. Uh, Pastor McMurtry is pre-mill, Pastor Clem is ah-mill, and I, myself, uh, I am post-mill. So we're going to just bring our views to the table. We're going to discuss and talk about these things. We have so many things in common. Uh, we're independent Baptists, and we hold a lot of similar views. And Brother McMurtry is a great guy, as is uh, Brother Clem, and if you didn't see my interview already with Brother Scott, make sure that you go watch that. So he recently had a very similar journey that I have had, um, and he moved from you know dispensationalism to covenant theology, and then ultimately he moved from premillennialism to a view of ah mill, post mill, very similar to my own position. And uh, he kind of works through that and talks through that and kind of gives a, a personal testimony about the difficulties and the challenges of it. He talks about uh, his scriptural journey of just what passages he worked through and kind of how God opened his eyes uh, slowly throughout, um, you know, his his transition, if you will. Um, that's that's the first reason for this video. Um, and I'll get to the content of this video in just a second. The second reason is because there's uh, there's a renewed interest in eschatology. People have always been interested in eschatology, and of course there are going to be peaks and, pit and, and pits where people are more interested and less interested, uh, depending on events or whatever happens uh, that changes that. But um, there's, there's a difference this time, a refreshing difference. And I've been guilty of this as well, but people in the past have frequently been very tribal. They've been very closed-minded. Um, they have just been very... Really what that comes down to, to is that they're insecure about their beliefs, and they're not, they weren't willing, oftentimes in the past, people weren't willing to talk about um, their beliefs with others that hold an opposing view. They wouldn't hear other people out. They wouldn't kind of bring their, you know, their beliefs to the table. Now, obviously, if we believe something, we should have a reason why we believe it, and therefore we should have a level of confidence in it, or we shouldn't just, we shouldn't just flippantly be you know, accepting or holding two positions. And we shouldn't be scared to talk to somebody else with a differing view than our own. We should be willing to engage with them in humility, especially another brother that just differs on an end times position. We should be willing to engage with them on the discussion charitably, with grace and kindness, and just kind of fight through these things. We should have a humble enough heart that if they show us something we're wrong about, we repent of that. We change that in transition uh, and convert over to what's right. We shouldn't Again, we shouldn't do that you know, irresponsibly and without, you know, properly trying it with Scripture and proving it and seeing whether those things are so. But we should, the state of our hearts should be humble enough to where we can discuss these things with other brothers and, and sisters. And if we are shown to be wrong, you know, we, we just accept what the truth is. We should have, have an attitude where we want to know what the Bible teaches and um, so, and if, and if you want to know what the truth is and you're confident in your own position, what are you worried about when it comes to talking to other people? A lot of the name calling and things that comes from insecurities, that comes from people that are, you know, you know, they're not very, they're defensive and they're not very confident in their own view. So, uh, and, and, and pride. So um, there's been a very good attitude, a very godly, I would say it's a godly attitude where people have had more humility. They're willing to reevaluate what they believe, come to the table. But there's also been a lot of confusion with this, which that's, that's you know, that's natural. That makes sense, okay? Um, 
people have been trying to discuss these issues. They've been they've been uh, in so doing, confusing some some things, conflating some issues. A lot of people are they're wanting to get their feet wet and get in on the conversation because it's exciting. And of course, first time you ride a bike, you're gonna fall off. You gotta you know. You got to learn. You got to make some mistakes to learn in the beginning, and just so long as you're as careful as you can be, and you're not irresponsible in your conversations, um, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people can be purpose, you know, they're purposefully muddying the waters and causing confusion and being dishonest and making straw mans. That again shows that you're defensive, and that you're insecure, and that you're you're not willing to, you know, you're you know, you don't really have a whole lot of confidence in actually what you believe. So. What I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to give you the lay of the land on the various eschatological positions because I, I think people are very confused about you know what each of the positions are, what they teach, and what are the differences between them. Okay, so first of all, the word or the term eschatology just means literally the study of last things or the study of the end times. We'll say oftentimes end times Bible prophecy. That's all that that word means. And words like that can be scary until somebody defines it for you, and then it's very simple. Um, it's good to have those words, though, because it's just a quick, easy word where we can just refer to something. Um, and we do that with everything. The Bible, for crying out loud. That is, that is it itself is not a, a word or a term that we find in the Bible. Now, um, the three basic positions, if we kind of start out on a macro level, we zoom out, would be premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. Today, the most common view is premillennialism, but that's not the case throughout church history. You can do a very quick search on a search engine, Google, pull it up, and just you know type in what is the most common view of eschatology in church history, and it is amillennialism. Now, amillennialism and postmillennialism are very similar. Sometimes you can't even tell the difference. I I'll explain to you what it is, but especially if you're new to it, they look very similar. Now, um, there are two types of premillennialism, and I'll and I'll get to that in just a minute. Let me do one thing too. The these three views: premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. They all get their name from when the second coming of Christ is going to take place in relation to the rapture. So for example, uh, or I'm sorry, in relation to the millennial reign. Sorry. So all of them get their name from when they believe the second coming of Christ will occur in relation to the millennial reign. Now this is somewhat unfortunate because that term millennial only occurs um, or a thousand years is really w what is mentioned, but it only occurs in one chapter in the entire Bible, and that's Revelation 20. But nonetheless, that's how the, the views are defined. And um, so premillennium, for example, a premillennial or a, pre the pr a premillennial position basically states that Christ will return before the time period that Revelation 20 talks about, that is the millennial reign. Okay, the thousand years of Christ. Christ will come back before that. Christ's second coming occurs before the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign. And they would believe, of course, if Christ is coming back before that, that he is here and present physically on earth during the millennial reign. There are various views, more views, um, and more differences within premillennialism than any other view. So I'll come back to that and get to that in just a minute. Now, amillennialism is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it's a new moniker. It's a new designation. In the past, it wasn't really referred to as amillennialism. It was infer it was referred to as postmillennialism. Uh, so I I'll I'll explain that difference here in just a minute. But today, what we call amillennialism is a what would be considered a partial preterist view. That is, that they believe that many of the events of revelation have taken place and that the millennial reign is occurring right now but it's occurring in heaven now ah millennial people would oftentimes hear the ah and that is a negating prefix in most cases that's why this is somewhat of a misnomer it's it's it's, it's a misleading designation because they believe in a millennial reign they just believe that the passages that refer to the millennial reign the passages in the old testament that speak of this golden age or millennial reign that it's occurring in heaven and that it began 
roughly around the time of Christ's first coming and the destruction was consummated at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And we've entered into that millennial reign. However, that occurs in heaven and that Christ is reigning now and that the kingdom of God has come. Um, but really the blessings and all of that is felt in heaven. That would be the amillennial position. Now, they would still believe that Christ's second coming is after the millennial reign. And they still hold to a second coming of Christ. So they believe that Christ is reigning. It's an indefinite amount of time. The thousand is not literal. It's symbolic of a long time. And that Christ will return following the millennial reign. When it's over, he comes back at the very end of the world. The resurrection takes place, and the judgment occurs at that time, too. And then we enter into what is known as the eschaton. That's the eternal state. Okay? Now, postmillennialism is very similar to amillennialism. Uh, postmillennialism, obviously, given the name, uh, teaches that Christ comes back after the thousand-year reign. So it also would be what is considered a partial preterist position. And partial preterism just says that, you know, preterism speaks to history, that it's past. And it is just to say that many of the events of Revelation, not all of them, but many of the events of Revelation are past. They have been fulfilled. And they were fulfilled also uh, in 70 AD. I say also that's what the amillennialists believe. So both positions would have this in common. So they're both po uh, partial preterists. The postmillennial position is a partial preterist position. And it is to say that uh, the millennial reign began at the time of Christ's first coming, consummated at 70 A.D. and the destruction of Jerusalem. But the post-millennialist is typically more optimistic, and they would um, have a different view of the nature of the kingdom. So not only is the nature, or I'm sorry, not only is the, is the kingdom and the reign of Christ occurring in heaven and the blessings being poured out in heaven, but um, a post-millennialist would have an optimistic view in that an optimistic view of human history. They would say that um, the blessings of God and God's kingdom is also felt and experienced on earth during this time. So we are in the millennial reign now, and we are experiencing the millennial reign. And the things that are prophesied of in the Old Testament, of the times of peace and prosperity— that that is occurring now. Now, one of the distinctives of the post-millennial position, which I myself am a post-millennialist, so I can throw this out there, is that um, we believe that these blessings and, and the kingdom of God that, that the blessings are associated with slowly are growing out into the world. Uh, it's like the rock that smites the feet of the, of the statue. The kingdom comes as a stone, it's called, small, but then it grows into a great mountain that fills all the earth. It starts as a little bit of leaven that's put into two lumps until it fills, and the whole lump is leaven. Uh, it starts out like a mustard seed, Christ said, the kingdom of God, and then it, it, it grows until um, you know, all of the fowl of the air come. That's all of the Gentiles. That's representing the whole earth. Uh, that's what the post. That's how the post millennialists would um, interpret those passages and those scriptures. So the, the the biggest difference between the amillennial view and the post millennial view is the optimism, optimism, and the nature of the kingdom. Uh, now there are optimistic ah mills. So this is where it gets really tricky, and it can get very very uh, difficult in some cases to tell them apart. That's why amillennial, as I said, is a new moniker. They're very, very similar. Biggest difference is the optimism and the nature of the kingdom and how we think these blessings are going to pour out. Even among postmillennialists, there is more optimism. There's more optimism with some crowds and camps than with others. Um, and there's even differings on what's going to happen at the end of the millennial reign. There are many people um, that would say that there's going to be an, apo an apostasy that occurs at the end of the millennial reign. Um, there are other people that don't believe that. There are some that believe that the kingdom's growing and that things are getting better, the gospel's going forth and conquering the nations. Of course, it's spiritual, but it works its way out into a physical world. But also, uh, there's going to be a golden age at the end. And some people would say, hey, I believe there will be a literal thousand years at that point as well. Um, so both would 
typically, ah, mill and post mill typically say that the thousand is symbolic of a really long time, though. Um, but that's those are the three basic positions. Now I, I've defined for you almost entirely ah millennialism and post millennialism. Of course, there's other, many other details, but I'm going to spend some more time on pre millennialism because there's a lot more variations um, among pre millennialism. Now, as I said before, pre millennialism teaches that Christ will come before the millennial reign, and therefore he will be present and, f and physically here during his reign. Furthermore, within premillennialism, there are a variety of views. Um, today, the premillennial views that are available are really going to be, almost all the time, dispensational premillennialism. And um, there are people that don't hold to dispensationalism, but they necessarily as a system and in interpreting the Bible systematically, but yet would would end up holding a lot of the the uh, uh, elements of dispensational um, uh, premillennialism, and maybe they aren't aware of that. Um, but this the, the premillennial views today, which are typically pr dispensational premillennialism, would break down into three positions. Um, the book of Revelation talks about a seven-year period, and uh, this seven-year period is sometimes referred to by some people as the whole seven years being the tribulation. Other people will separate the first three and a half years and say that's the tribulation, but then the last three and a half years, that's God's wrath. Um, but there are varying opinions in specificity when people think Christ will return that are pre-mill. For example, some people that are pre-mill believe that Christ comes back before that seven-year period even begins. And these people would be called pre-trib. So before the seven-year tribulation begins, they, say, they believe that Christ comes back and they don't experience anything that happens during that time period. And, and that view would refer to the entire seven years as tribulation, and they kind of think that it's all tribulation and, and wrath. They mix it together. There's also another view that would call itself post-trib pre-wrath, and this is what I formerly was. And this view states that Jesus returns in the middle of the seven-year period. The first three and a half years is tribulation, where it's persecution. The Antichrist is on the earth during this time, and there's persecution of Christians. Then the rapture occurs, okay, in the middle of this three and a half year period. And then God begins to pour out his wrath following that. At the end of the seven years, then Jesus returns with all of his saints. Okay, so they, Christ would come back, and this is still, of course, the pre-millennial position. So you'd have the seven-year period occurring first, right? And then Jesus actually comes to the earth. He comes back after the seven years is finished, and then he begins his millennial reign. Now, that's the same with the pre-mill, pre-trib position as well. The only difference is the the church, they would say, all of the saints on the earth at that time are raptured out before the, the seven-year period of time begins. Uh, Christ comes back. Christ deals with Israel during that seven-year period of time. Christ comes back and returns to the earth physically after the seven-year period, and then he begins his millennial reign, sets up his physical kingdom, and he reigns from Jerusalem. Okay, uh, another position is the post-wrath position. And these people may sometimes call themselves post-tribulation because they as well might say, hey, the whole seven years is tribulation. But I'll, for this video, refer to it as the post-wrath, for simplicity's sake, the post-wrath position. And they would believe that the whole seven years um, occurs and then Christ comes back. And they would not necessarily believe that there's a rapture and they go to heaven. That is, the saints that are on the earth go to heaven and then come back. But what they believe is that saints are on earth. They endure the entire seven-year period of time, the tribulation and the wrath. And then Christ comes back to defeat the enemies, the Antichrist. And then he sets up his kingdom on earth and he physically reigns on earth. 
Okay, so that would be the post-wrath position. Um, now, the other view of dis of I'm sorry, premillennialism is historic premillennialism. Now, this is one of the mistakes that I've been hearing lately, and I, now I'm going to address real quickly the two mistakes that I've been hearing. The first one is a mistake about what historic premillennialism is. There are many people that are not dispensational, as I already alluded to, um, but are premillennial, and they still hold on to elements of dispensational premillennialism. And I'm going to demonstrate that real quickly. So... Historic premillennialism was categorically just, you know, uh, unanimously, I'll say, unanimously post seven years. Uh, it's referred to as historic premill to differentiate the two views. So within the second and third century, there were Christians that held to a premillennial view. But then premillennialism fell off the map. Nobody believed it, and really, until dispensationalism had its kind of comeback. Uh, well, not comeback; it was invented. Okay, once dispensationalism was kind of you know systematized and all of that, that's when premillennialism came back. Well, so these there's these two views of premillennialism: historic premill and dispensational premill, and there are difference between differences between them. What that's why they have the two designation so that we can know what position people hold to. Now, um, historic pre-mill would not be dispensational in its systematic, okay? They would not have the hard line uh, difference between the church and Isra Israel. Now, there are some people that are dispensational pre-mill that would do the same, but this is a tenet of historic pre-mill. Another element of hi of historic pre-mill or a, you know a tenant of it would be the post seven year belief post wrath uh, rapture resurrection and this is really the biggest difference this is the primary difference between the two positions historic pre-mill is unanimously in church history post seven years and even those that today which there are some that hold to a historic pre-mill position this is their biggest gripe about the dispensational pre-mill position, and that's this. They disdain the idea of Christ coming first for his saints and then coming with his saints. That is, they hate the idea of Christ coming back, you know, for example, before the tribulation begins to rapture all the saints to heaven, but then he returns you know, after the seven-year period officially, and that's his coming um, for setting up the kingdom and so forth. So they would they would mock this idea oftentimes and attack it at least if they're charitable. They would still argue against it and say there's two comings, right? You, know, you, you have two second comings. They would also, this is a big difference again, between the post-tribulation pre-wrath position and the historic pre-mill. So post-trib pre-wrath is by its nature not historic pre-mill because historic pre-mill believes in one second coming of Christ. They harp on this. So if you are post-trib pre-wrath, you definitely would fall into, at least in this you know, piece, the dispensational pre-mill. You still hold to the idea that Christ comes for his saints, raptures them to heaven, albeit it's in the middle of the three and a half years, you know, the seven years. It's three and a half in, rapture, and then three and a half. I, I understand that. But you still believe that he's coming for his saints the first time and with his saints. And the historic pre mill guy would still say, you believe in two second comings of Christ. That's, you know... That's that's not historic pre-mill, they would say. Um, another point of historic pre-mill that's different than dispensational pre-mill is that historic premillennialists do not take the book of Revelation literal in the same way that dispensational pre-mill, premillennial believers do. So they wouldn't take, you know, uh, the whore, the horses. Um, with s serpents as their tails, literal. They wouldn't take the locusts 
you know, that come out of hell literal, right? They, would, they wouldn't take a lot of these things literal. They would, they would realize, which I believe this as well, that the book of Revelation is symbolic in nature. Uh, okay, um, so that's a big difference between historic pre-mill and dispensational pre-mill as well. Um, furthermore, uh, another difference between historic pre-mill and dispensational pre-mill is that uh, dispensational pre-mill, um, they believe that Daniel's 70th week has not yet been fulfilled. And they apply Daniel's 70th week to the book of Revelation. They believe that, hey, Daniel's 70th week is the same event of the book of Revelation, and it just wasn't fulfilled. So they believe in and they hold to a big gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. That's dispensational pre-mill. So historic pre-mill does, did not teach that. That is the invention of dispensationalism. And, in fact, it is the again, it harkens back to the separation between the church and Israel. Uh, Scorby, uh, when he—oh, I'm sorry, not Scorby, Schofield. Scorby's good, too, though. You should listen to him, read the Bible. So Schofield and John Nelson Darby— their system of dispensationalism was built around this distinction between Israel and the church. And the way that they retained a piece of the pie for, for the nation of Israel later was that they said that this, there was a pause, basically, after the 69th week. And that the 70th week is still to come and that there's a gap now between the 69th and the 70th week. And there's really been a 2,000-year gap. Okay, the 69th week, everything with Jesus' first coming, that's fulfilled, but there's this big, huge gap. And this is what we call the church age. And this is the mystery, they would say, that, that Paul talks about and that was not foreseen by the prophets, which I don't, I don't agree with that, but that's, that, this is what they teach. And, um, you know, there's a gap, and the 70th week is still to come. And, and, Schofield and John Nelson Darby, they taught the pre-trib rapture. So you can see how pre-trib goes with dispensational theology and dispensational premillennialism, which is why you have the rapture taking place, but then God pours out his wrath on the earth, and the tribulation begins with the Antichrist you know, um, for the seven years, and God begins to deal with Israel again. That is in the, the, the dispensational view. You can see how dispensational premillennialism works with the system of dispensationalism, which is built around the distinction between Israel and the church. Now, a post-trib pre-wrath position would just say, hey, there's a rapture three and a half years in, all of God's people are gone, and then there's really you know, none of God's people left on the earth for the three and a half years. That would be their position. And then Christ comes back you know, at the end of the three and a half years. Um, but you know, so, so dispensational premillennialism today would uh, a big difference in this position would be uh, Daniel's 70th week still to come. Uh, that and historic premillennialism would say, no, Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled. Um, and Revelation is still in the future, but these are different events. They would, the historic premill would acknowledge that Matthew 24, in most cases, of course there's variations. You may find people today that would say they're not influenced by dispensational premillennialism, but at, at least the historic premill position traditionally would say that, hey, Daniel's 70th week is fulfilled, Matthew 24 even. Yes, that was about Daniel's 70th week, and that was fulfilled on Israel. However, the book of Revelation is not the same as Daniel's 70th week, and that is about end times. And they would believe that, that, the, the, that Christians, the saints, are there during that whole seven-year period, and at the end of the seven-year period is when we see Christ return, Christ comes back to the earth, and the rapture, that's why it says we meet him in the air, we meet him because he's coming back. And I would share that, you know, not the timing of that event, but I would share that in common and that I believe we meet him in the air as a post-millennialist because he's coming to the earth. And that's what the historic pre position would say. They would say, yeah, because he comes back once at the end of the seven years to set up his kingdom, 
we meet him in the air as he's coming to the earth. He defeats the Antichrist, and then he sets up his kingdom, and he, he literally and physically reigns on the earth for a thousand years. So that's a huge difference. So uh, with that difference of Daniel's 70th week and these things, um, additionally, the historic pre-mill position would also um, adhere to the belief that that Christ is reigning now, um, that it's what they would say is already but not yet. And that's common language theologically, but hi- those that are historic pre-mill today that really hold to all the traditional points of historic pre-mill, they would say, you know, Christ's reign is already but not yet, and that he is reigning and that he came, to, and that the kingdom of God came, but it's already but not yet. There are many videos that you can see comparing the difference. If you wanted to just search on YouTube, the differences between historic pre-mill and dispensational pre-mill, where people lay out these differences for you, and you'll see these, you know, the things that I'm saying are true. You can look it up on Wikipedia. They give you basically the same uh, descriptions that I that I gave you here about these two differences. Um, but just because you don't believe in dispensationalism does not mean that you have not been influenced by dispensational premillennialism. So I've seen a lot of people really muddying the waters on this issue. Some people definitely were not doing it purposely. It's because they themselves aren't dispensational, so they don't think that they are dispensational premillennial, obviously. Um, but, you know, we all hold on to, you know, traditions that we don't, we're not even aware of sometimes. Um, now, furthermore, the other error that I've been seeing people make, and this is huge. This is the most important area, error. Obviously, to me, you know, uh, it's personal, but um, some people could be dishonest, and then other people's people could just not be aware of the differences. And that is the difference between hyper-preterism and orthodox preterism, or full preterism and partial preterism. Now, full preterism, hyper-preterism, also is known as preterism. So when you say preterism, you're talking about full preterism and hyper-preterism. Over here is what is known as partial preterism and orthodox preterism. These are two very different things. And a full preterist, or just a preterist, they believe that everything is past. All of the book of Revelation has taken place. Every prophecy, there is nothing yet to occur. Everything has happened. Now, that's very dangerous. Okay? <laughs> that's a, to, be, to be honest, as we get into the details here, that's heresy. If someone believes that they are not a Christian, they're not properly a Christian. Now, of course, people can kind of get into error for a period of time, and time will tell. But if someone actually holds to that view, they are not a Christian because they are denying um, fundamental beliefs of what it means to be a Christian in the orthodox sense, just the, a, a sound doctrine, a biblical sense. The, the preterist or the, the full preterist, they believe that the resurrection has occurred and that there is no bodily resurrection. They believe that it's all spiritual. They believe that the judgment took place and that there is no literal judgment where we stand before uh, Christ or God. Okay? They believe that all of the events have taken place. The new heavens and the new earth have already occurred. They are here, and this is it. And they believe that, essentially, earth and human history are just going to continue as they are today. Right? And that God is not going to restore this earth. And heaven and what we are to experience when we live with Christ and eternally is, is I'm sorry, what we are going to experience eternally and when we are in with Christ is heaven, and there's nothing else. We will never return to this earth. There will never be a restoration of this earth. There is no resurrection, and there is no judgment. Now, that is a denial of the basic, basic fundamental tenets of what it means to be a Christian. The second coming of Christ, the bodily resurrection, and the judging, him judging, coming to judge the quick and the dead, that is orthodox Christianity. Okay, that's huge. So you can start to see the differences here already. That's what full preterism believes. Now, partial preterism acknowledges all of those things, which is why it is referred to 
as properly orthodox preterism because it affirms the orthodox Christian faith, the fundamentals of the Christian faith. There's a massive difference between these two things. Now, today, you know, from what I can tell, it's exclusively Church of Christ members that hold to full preterism outside of just kind of the randoms, okay? There's maybe some people that claim to be free grace or claim to be, you know, all other sorts of backgrounds, Pentecostals. I've seen just random ones, but... You know, in an organized way, the only people that I've that I that that I believe today, and I'm I'm fairly sure of this, fairly certain of this, um, is that Church of Christ members hold to this. I know Don, Don Preston is probably the most famous advocate of full preterism, or what is just known as preterism. But partial preterism, all millennialism, is a view is a a form of partial preterism. Uh, so partial preterism is the dominating view throughout Christian church history. And in fact, almost every Christian church in the 16th century, 17th century, uh, in the United States of America, 18th century, were partial preterists. Before the introduction of dispensational premillennialism, look it up. Look up all Baptist statements, the statements of faith that you can find. Look up everything that you can find, and essentially everyone was amillennial or postmillennial. The Puritans, they were specifically postmillennial. Um, you know, just uh, there were various types among the pilgrims. Puritans were a type of them. Um, but the separatists, you know, um, the, all of the Protestants, uh, those that translated the King James Bible, that is those of the Church of England, um, you know, uh, King James himself, they were all post-millennial, amillennial. Like I said, they're almost the exact same position. So these are huge differences. These are not small differences. These are the differences that separate Christian from non-Christian. Okay, there, there, are, there are certain things that make us a Christian. And the blessed hope, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection, the renewing of all things, the restoration— I mean, uh, you know, God making all things new once again, that is part that is core and essential to Christianity. It is a fundamental of Christianity. So so these are the basics of I went on a lot longer than I wanted to. But this video, I think, is very profitable for many people. Throw some comments down there. We can talk about this. I want to talk eschatology. I, I'm, I'm very excited about people being open. I think more people need to be open-minded. Everybody needs to not be so sensitive and defensive and uh, stop being a little girl. You know, be willing to just kind of discuss these things openly. Everybody's not going to hell because they have a differing view on, you know, when on how the end times work out. OK, than you do. So let's just let's have these conversations openly. And I hope that you'll tune in to the conversation um, that the discussion that's going to take place on Pastor Big Murtry's channel. And I am excited about what could come out of all of this. And let's talk eschatology. God bless you, and have a good day.